So, Namaskar friends, welcome back to this second part of the lecture on audition. This series of lectures is designed for the course on engineering psychology and for the past few lectures, we have been looking at how engineering psychology works. In the last lecture, we looked at the sensory capability of audition. In continuation with the last lecture, in today's lecture, I will explain to you some of the features of the auditory sensory system, quickly reviewing what we did in the last lecture. We understood what is sound and how is sound produced. We looked at how sound is measured and then we looked at how there are different types of sound and how complex sound can be arranged and expressed in simple sound using the Fourier theorem. Further, we looked at the human ear. I described the physiology of the human ear in terms of the outer ear, the inner ear and the middle ear. I explained to you how sound is registered and then interpreted through the human ear. And lastly, I discussed the vestibular system, which is a system which is associated with the human ear and helps us in maintaining position. The vestibular system helps human in maintaining an upright position and tracking head movements and torso movements. So, we looked at how the physiology of the vestibular system works, how the acceleration and body movements are captured by the vestibular system and how balance and orientation are maintained by the vestibular system. The last point that we discussed was about motion sickness. We looked at the causes of motion sickness and the two opposing theories of motion sickness. In today's lecture, we will look at some properties of sound and the nature of sound. We will look at how to harness these properties and use it in our benefit in terms of designing warnings and alert systems which can help human operators. So, let us begin. Now, if you remember from the last class, we talked about that any sound can be explained in terms of frequency and amplitude. Whereas, frequency corresponds to the pitch, the amplitude corresponds to the intensity or loudness. So, how is the human ear coding pitch and loudness? Now, also if you remember from the last class, we talked about the perception of sound technically happens at the level of the inner ear through an organ which is called the cochlea. So, the sound is actually perceived by the inner ear through a structure called the cochlea. Now, if you remember, this is what the structure of the cochlea seems like. So, you have a snail shaped system. The perception of sound and the interpretation of sound is done by the human cochlea. And if you remember from the last class, this is the shape of a cochlea. There are three layers within this and the inner layer of the cochlea is called the bacillar membrane. Now, we have talked about the eardrum. So, sound passes through the auditory canal, hits the eardrum and the eardrum vibrates accordingly. This is transferred to the inner ear through the oval window and this vibration gets transferred as a traveling wave in the liquid which is filling the cochlea. Now, the liquid is centered around the bacillar membrane which is the inner layer of the cochlea. So, all interpretations relating to loudness and frequency 
happens at this level of the cochlea which is through the basilar membrane. Now, if you open up the human cochlea it will and straighten it up it will be around 1.5 feet approximately and there will be a layer in the middle of this which is called the basilar membrane. The basilar membrane has hair cells which move due to the movement of the inner air liquid and this movement of in inner ear liquid happens through the vibration of the eardrum and the connected oval window. So, bas basilar membrane while stimulating the ear with different sound frequencies generate traveling wave that peaks at different points along the basilar membrane. So, you have this eardrum and the attached oval window with it sound hits here and this eardrum vibrates. This vibration is transferred onto this liquid which is flowing and this liquid then starts flowing by generating traveling waves. The different sound frequencies which hit the eardrum makes it vibrate at different speeds and because of this the movement happens in this liquid and the different frequencies at which this membrane is vibrating creates different standing waves. Now, these standing waves travel through the length of this basilar membrane peaking at different points. So, the same since the same eardrum is vibrating for so many different frequencies it creates wave after wave and these wave after wave then move through this liquid and then create different traveling waves. These traveling waves they maximize at different points along the basilar membrane and that is why you have that different sound frequencies generate traveling waves that peak at different points along the basilar membrane because it is of different frequency. The idea is that the higher sound frequencies they peak at the base. So, this is where the connection is of the oval window with the basilar membrane. The highest frequencies which is around 20,000 hertz they peak at the base of this basilar membrane or the point which connects this basilar membrane to the oval window. And as you move along this basilar membrane you will see responses to lower and lower frequencies with the 20,000 hertz peaking at the base the 20 hertz frequency peaks at the apex of this basilar membrane. This particular arrangement is called the tonotropic arrangement of the basilar membrane. So, with higher sound frequencies peaking near the base and lower frequencies peaking near the apex of the basilar membrane. The ear encode sound frequencies using something called the place code where hair cells distributed along the length of the basilar membrane encode different sounds between 20 to 20,000 hertz. As I just explained if this is my basilar membrane and this is the connection to the oval window and here are the hair cells which are meant to encode or record the movement of the liquid or the movement of the different waves which are formed between the liquid due to this vibration of the eardrum and the connected oval window there will be different peaks since there will be different waves. Now, at the base of it you have hair cells which can record peaks for 20,000 hertz wave and at the end of it or towards the apex of the basal membrane you have hair cells which record 20 hertz frequency. Now, if there are different waves which are 
being sent through this liquid they will be detected by different hair cells. So, the place of a hair cell is important in recording different frequency waves. This property is called the place code. So, where the frequency is speaking and being recorded that particular place codes for the frequency of the sound wave. Now, the place cell and the place code gives a very good explanation for those sound frequencies which are of high value anything above the 50,000, 5000 hertz, but low frequency sounds they are not very nicely detected by the hair cells. For explaining how the low frequency sounds are encoded, a different theory has been proposed which is called the Wally theory. Now, if you read this, it explains that place code offers a good explanation for encoding of high frequency, but not low frequency tones. The simple reason, reason being that the high frequency tones will subside the lower frequency tones. And the fact that the lower frequency tones will have a broader amplitude and because of that they may not be coded by the hair cells. So, there is a different mechanism for coding it, but first let us understand what really happens. This is because low frequency tones produce travelling waves with broader peaks, whereas 20,000 hertz frequency tones will produce peaks like this, 20 hertz tone will produce a peak like this these are much broader than these and because of this if we superimpose both of them or try to process them one after another this will have lesser sensitivity of being recorded making it more difficult to identify the place or the bacillar membrane associated with a specific frequency. How then are lower frequency sound waves perceived? They are perceived by the association of firing of multiple hair cells. The Wally principle explains that groups of auditory fibers may collaboratively respond to peak of each cycle of the stimulus by alternating which fibers responds to peak of the traveling wave. Thus, the combined response of a group of fibers the Wally encode the stimulus frequency. What it suggests? is that one place cell or one group of cells which are located at a place does not code one unique frequency rather multiple group of hair cells encode a different frequency. So, let us say there are 5 different groups which encode 20,000 hertz. Now, if the next peak of the traveling wave has only 4 group of fibers getting excited, maybe it codes 10,000 hertz. If lesser, maybe it codes 20 hertz and this is how. So, how many group of fibers are actually getting excited will decide what frequency of sound is creating the traveling wave in the liquid. So, this is what the Wally principle explains. Again more intense sound results in larger displacement of the bacillar membrane and bending of the hair cells that causes neurons to fire more rapidly. So, frequencies are coded by the place or group of fibers which encode the various peaks of the traveling wave. But then how is intensity or loudness encoded? They are encoded by how much the hair cells are bent or how much displacement of the bacillar membrane is happening. The more the displacement, the more forcefully a wave travels, the more power the liquid will have and the more bending. So, this is my hair cell typical 
and the more bending that this hair cell does, the more the neurons which is attached to it will fire. More bending will lead to more firing or more excitation and with more excitation loudness is encoded. So, more intense sounds result in larger displacement of the basilar membrane and bending of the hair cells that causes neurons to fire more rapidly. Now, firing rate is one way that the auditory system encodes sound amplitude that we perceive as loudness. So, whereas different hair cells by their position or by their grouping encode the frequency, the more force with which the hair cells are bent encode the loudness. This is a typical diagram to show you how all this happens. As I explained to you, this is my uncalled cochlea. This is the basilar membrane and as you can see, you have different hair cells which are specialized to encode different frequencies, auditory sensitivity, how sensitive is the auditory system. Now, auditory sensitivity is directly related to how efficiently you perceive a warning signal. So, let us look at how quickly or how sensitive an auditory system is. It has been found that unequal sensitivity to different sound frequencies. The auditory system has unequal sensitivity. For some sound frequencies, it is highly sensitive, but for some other sound frequencies, the sensitivity varies and the explanation of this sensitivity can be experimentally understood by using the theory of magnitude estimation by S. S. Stevens. What it does is, a sound of a frequency is produced which is called the bass sound and then subjects are then made to hear a sound which is of a different frequency from the standard sound and they are asked to rate how high or how low the sound is. It is found that at lower pitches when the difference is low, the sensitivities vary in a different way than when the differences are high. It has been found that the sensitivity of the human ear has a maximum response within the 100 to 400, 4000 hertz range. To show you how sensitive or how efficient the auditory system is, Nobel Prize winning auditory physiologist George Bexy estimated that hearing sensitivity is so acute that vibrations of the eardrum as small as 1 billionth of a centimeter or roughly 1 tenth of a diameter of a hydrogen atom can be detected by the listeners. So, the, the system is very sensitive, but these sensitivities vary across different frequencies. There is a theorem which is called the Weber's theorem. If you refer back to another course of mine, which is on human behavior and there if you look at the section on sensitivity, which is within the lecture of sensation, it will help you understanding how the sensory system functions and encodes. And there I have talked about the sensory estimation theorem. What it typically says is that if you increase the magnitude of the standard stimulus, the amount of change that you have to produce in a comparative stimulus would be higher. So, increase the price of something depends upon how much the earlier price is. I have a 5 rupees item and I increase the price by 1 rupees and if I have a 1 lakh rupees item and if I increase the price of this item by 1 rupees, the differences felt will not be same. Whereas, for the 5 rupees item, the change by 1 rupees will be too much. For the 1 lakh rupees item, 
the change in price by 1 rupees to 1 lakh 1 rupees will not be same although the value the difference that I am creating is only 1 rupees. This kind of unequal sensitivity or perception on un, uh, unequal sensitivity happens in the auditory system. So, how do people perceive pitch? Now, one thing I would like to make you understand here is that humans do not perceive each frequency of sound, rather humans perceive harmonics. Harmonics are multiplicative integers or multiplicative numbers by which you can increase a fundamental frequency. What do I mean by this? It means that there is one base frequency, let us say that it is 25 hertz or 200 hertz. So, the, if this is my base frequency or fundamental frequency, I will perceive sound in integers multiplicative to this. So, the next will be 400 frequency into 3 will give you 600 hertz frequency into 4 will give you 800 hertz frequency like that. So, there will be one base frequency and multiplicative integer multiplications of this is what you will be able to hear. There is a reason why this is done and this helps us in increasing the pitch perception and sensitivity of the human ear. Musical instruments also have this fundamental frequencies and increasing this fundamental frequencies by multiplying it with an integer is called the study of harmonics. So, fundamental frequency and harmonics I just explained to you fundamental frequency is that base frequency which you multiply by different integers to produce sounds of different pitch and these different pitch sounds are called the harmonics. So, even in sound that lacks the fundamental frequency, the perceived pitch of the sound that is human voice of musical instrument still corresponds to the fundamental frequency. It has been found that if I have a complex sound and mathematically I erase the fundamental frequency and I then present this complex sound to people and ask them about the perception. Even if the fundamental pre frequency is taken out, the base frequency, the primary frequency which when multiplied by different integers is creating the complex sound is taken out, people still hear that fundamental frequency, they recreate this fundamental frequency. A good example is the cell phone. Cheap cell phones have speakers which cannot create the 150 hertz frequency and this frequency is the fundamental frequency of male voice. But when somebody hears a male and female speaking on the phone through the speaker, they are able to distinguish them based on this fundamental frequency. So, people perceive sound in terms of one brace frequency which is called the fundamental frequency and then multiplicatives of it which creates the harmonics and total together creates the complex sound. Now, the perception of pitch depends on the fundamental frequency and the pattern of harmonic frequency in a sound. As I just explained to you, if 200 is the frequency which is the fundamental frequency and if I multiply it by 2, 4, 6, 8, it will create a different complex sound. Then if I multiply this 200 hertz frequency to 3, 6, 9. So, 2, 4, 6, 8 or 2, 4, 6 and 3, 6, 9 odd and even integers 
multiplicative of this fundamental frequency will create different harmonics and different complex sound. Now, timbre the quality of sound that allows listener to discriminate between a piano and a trumpet playing the same note. Timbre which is the quality of a sound also depends upon fundamental frequency. Had that not been true, people would not have been able to discriminate the C minor or A major sound which are produced by two different instruments. So, although the two different instruments may produce different sound for the same C or D minor, but while perceiving people are able to differentiate between them because they hear the fundamental frequency. Timber by the way is what is the quality of sound. So, that makes us understand how basic characteristics of sound are mapped and recorded by the auditory system. Now, we will look at something called masking and noise. So, what is masking? If two sounds are presented to you and one sound interferes with the perception of the other sound, this is called masking. The one sound which interferes with the perception of the other sound of interest is called the noise, whereas the sound of interest is called the stimuli of interest or sound of interest. So, the effect of noise on the ability to detect other signals is called masking. Noise is not always harmful. You would have seen that if the noise has the same frequency as the sound of interest, it creates greater interferences. But sounds which are of higher frequencies or lower frequency than the sound of interest tends to create lesser interferences. In factories which make a lot of noise, if two people talk, they will still be able to hear each other in the background of those machines which are making a different kind of noise, a different intensity noise. But if many people talk to each other in a similar frequency, they will interfere with each other. Think of a party where too many people are talking at the same rate and same frequency and then it creates more disturbance in hearing what your friend is saying, then in those cases where the noise is present, but the noise is of a different frequency. So, how the detection of one sound is affected by the presence of other sound can be experimentally studied by using the sound of interest, producing a sound of interest of a different frequency and alongside presenting a noise of different frequencies. Subjects are then asked to compare whether they can hear and distinguish the sound of interest from the noise. So, we have a situation where two groups are created. In one group, you have noises of different frequencies and a signal is present, the noise of or the sound of interest. And in the other group, you have the sound of interest and different noises and one more group where the sound of interest is not present, just the noise is present. And if you experimentally compare the results of these groups, you will be able to understand how detection is affected by the presence of noises. Now, the effects of masking are asymmetric. As I was just explaining a moment ago, that masking has a asymmetric effect on perception. At higher intensities, its effect extends to higher frequencies than at lower frequencies. So, for higher intensities, the higher frequency sounds will interfere with those target sounds which are of higher frequencies, but at lower frequencies, they may have lesser effect and something accordingly or something 
vice versa to it is seen at lower frequencies and higher frequencies. So, the relationship between intensity and loudness again referring back to what we discussed in a slide couple of moments ago the intensity and loudness can be measured through magnitude estimation. Here what happens is a typical standard sound is presented to people and then sounds of different frequencies and different loudness are presented alongside subjects are estimated the difference in the presented sound to the standard. So, if a standard of 20 hertz or 200 hertz is presented. So, if this is my standard and a next sound is produced standard next sound subjects are then asked to compare these two sounds how how intense or how different is the given sound from the standard. So, again this is my standard and this is my target and you have to then tell how high or low is the target from the standard. Now, a number of sounds are presented which needs to be compared to the standard and once you start from an ascending order in the other case you start from a descending order and then that sound is found out where 50 percent of the subject say that this is equivalent to the sound of the standard and that is cre created that sound is thought of as the standard sound or near to the standard sound. This difference between what the subject says the standard and the standard sound is known as just noticeable difference or that difference which will exist in the perception of two different sounds. Now, this can be studied by using something called the equal loudness contour using the something called the Fletcher Vinson curve. You can read about this in the book which is prescribed. Another interesting thing to look at here is that phone is the unit which is used to express perceived loudness of sound and zones are the uni u units which are used to express the relative loudness. So, whereas phones is about perceived loudness, zones tell you what is the difference between two phones or how relatively they are different. These curves can be created by using ma magnitude estimation and then express in terms of phones or phone and then a standard is created, a comparative sound is created and the difference between the standard and the comparative sound is what is expressed in sounds. So, how does the human ear localize sound? How does the human ear know where a sound is coming? And that happens through something called two measures which is the intraoral intensity and the intraoral timing difference. So, relative location of two sounds are done using auditory cues. One cue is the intraoral intensity detection and what it says is that differences in intensity of sound due to the relative position of the head of the listener which created something called an acoustic shadow. So, if a sound is produced to your left or right, the ear hears different intensities because the sound will travel not only to you from the forward direction, but it will also come to you from the backward direction or the pinna. This is the pinna. So, this sound will come here and it will also come from the back direction. And the difference that is between these two sounds that you hear is called the intraoral detection. So, the intensity of the sound which is coming to you direct will be higher and the one which you are receiving from the back will be slightly lower and this difference will tell you where exactly is a object whether it is in front of you or is it in back from you. 
Now, changes in the relative position of the head along the horizontal plane is called the azimuth. Sounds which come to you straight in relation to your head will have a 0 degree azimuth. But if a sound is left or right to you, it will have either a 90 degree if it is to the left or right, so plus 90 or minus 90. But if a sound is coming from your back, it will have a 180 degree azimuth. So, basically what happens is that where is the sound coming from? That is detected by the ear in terms of the frequencies of sound which the pinna of the ear receives from the forward and the backward direction. The angle also has some role to play here. If it is coming from your front or from the sides, there will be some timing difference and also intensity different. So, if you take two speakers in your uh, home and shift first between the speaker and hear them and then shift towards either of the speakers, you will hear a change in intensity. You will hear some kind of differences in sound and this basically is the means of localizing sound. So, changes in differences is one way of measuring it and the other is called the intraoral timing differences. Differences in the arrival of sound to the each ear. If the sound is coming right in front of you at 0 degree azimuth, the two ears will hear the same sound at same time. But if the sound is coming from the left and the right, one ear will hear the sound a little bit later. Although this timing difference is not too big, but still it can be perceived by the human ear and that makes you realize where is the object which is creating the sound. Now, due to the physical separation of the ears, sound from a source located on one side will, will reach one ear 640 milliseconds earlier than the other ear. Now, pina plays an important role in elevation detection. Where is the sound in above you or below you and the structure of this outer part of the ear is like a satellite dish and this helps you in locating the elevation, understanding where the sound is coming from. Pina selectively enhances or attenuated sound frequencies depending on elevation and point of contact. Whereas, if a sound is coming direct to you and hits here, it will be of a different frequency. But if it is coming from higher up and be down below, these structures will either extend, elevate or attenuate lower down the frequency and this cues are then perceived by the primary auditory cortex as elevation. That brings an end to the first part of this section, we were looking at how sounds is perceived, how they are understood and what is the physiological structure of encoding sound. Now, let us come at to the application of this. The use of all these human capabilities and limitations is done in terms of designing something called auditory displays. So, what are auditory displays and what are the certain principles of creating auditory displays? So, auditory dis displays encompasses a wide range of uses of sound to convey information to listeners. These different forms of conveying information to listeners can include warning statuses, the seat belt warning sign that you get, alarms, the clock alarm that you hear every day morning which wakes you up, status indicators, those tick tick sounds or higher frequency and lower frequency sound which comes from machine which tells you whether it is working correctly or not. Most of you would have heard this sound when your hard disk goes bad, so the sound increases as in something is being rubbed against something else. So, that is a status indicator which says that a sound is warning you or giving the status that the hard disk is 
not working properly or the ding ding sound which comes from the ending of cooking in a microwave oven. Instructions, those instructions which are given to the pilots before landing or if they do something wrong, if you sit in the first seat of a flight, you will hear if you try to do it this very patiently, just before landing the flight control system will tell the pilot saying that 40 meters, 30 meters retract, retract, retract. This is a warning sign to saying that retract the lever back so that the sound landing can be perfect. Similarly, pull up sounds which are given by the onboard computers and flights to pilots when the computer system detects that it is very near to the ground or when it is entered in a position which can make it crash and then another indicator is called sonification. So, we will explain these one by one. Now, the principal purpose to, uh, of these kind of warning systems or auditory displays is to alert and notify the listener that certain events have occurred without destructing the ongoing task. Think of a pilot, he is listening in to the ACAS broadcast, TCAS or the ACAS broadcast. He is also visually seeing so many dials and talking to the flight engineer. The auditory display is made in such a way that it conveys minimal information, but important information. So, if the plane has a nose up in such a way that it can stall, the auditory system will warn saying that your plane is bent in such a way or is elevated in such a way that it can stall now. So, lower down the wings or do something to counter this situation. Cautions and warnings are special classes of display which is used to indicate the adverse event. So, if an adverse event happens, a class of warning occur, for example, flyer alarms. This tell you that certain situations have happened and you have to take a counteractive measure. Information communicated is limited as they indicated change of state. So, auditory displays have limited information they can convey, but mostly they convey changes in information state. So, these cautions and warnings are sort of an auditory display which communicate that something has changed and you should take note of it. Speech may be used as an auditory display. Synthesized speech or concatenated segments of recording words are used as instructions. In the railway stations or in the airports, you have a sound and a filler sound, a mechanical filler in between this sound. So, it says so and so train is coming, train number and then there is a mechanical sound which gives the train number is arriving at platform number. Again, the platform number is created by a mechanical sound. So, these in between mechanical sounds or automated sounds are ways of warning people. This can be used. So, typically the person who is announcing would record the sentence with breaks and these breaks are can be modified by using different computer generated sounds which tell you which train number, which platform, what class of train, what time all these things can be filled and this is one way of using auditory displays. Now, the auditory displays are of four different classes. You have personal devices, transportation, military and control room. What are they? In personal devices, the auditory displays can be in terms of the alarms, the clock, the cell phone and the interesting thing is that it is intended for a single user. For transportation, the auditory displays can be of more than one type and for more than one operator. For example, cars and trucks. So, different drivers drive them and 
the auditory displays in terms of not putting the seat belt or warning signs in terms of low battery, low engine oil. So, this kind of displays which I meant for multiple drivers because multiple drivers drive cars or those systems which says that in a metro the station is coming to the left or right this is meant for multiple people and so this kind of auditory signals can be or auditory displays can be used. In military also you there is a use of auditory display specialized training and used to signify external thirds and internal failure systems. The military uses certain codes for displaying threats and system failures. I can see my 20, he is at your 6. All these codes are used by military to signify that some assailant is somewhere in relation to where the person who is supposed to counteract this assailant is. So, it will tell you the relative position and so this kind of codes are used, warning signals are used. And then within the control room also these kind of auditory signals are used. Alarm designed to support supervisory control where operator monitor complex system. So, if the operators are monitoring complex systems and he cannot look at all the dial at the same point of time. There are auditory warnings which will tell that this particular section of the machine you need to look at now. If you are monitoring temperature, pressure and so many other things, an increase in pressure in one unit or increase in temperature or some other factor in one unit can tell you that now pay attention to this unit and then you can go back to monitoring that display that you are monitoring for keeping the system safe. Now, what is the advantage of an auditory display? Omnidirectionality. Sound can come from any direction and people can hear them and one advantage of auditory displays is that from any place if the sound comes in, from any direction it comes in, people can hear it. Also single auditory stimulus tend to elicit faster responses. If one auditory response uh, is given or one auditory signal is given, it will be easily perceived and give a faster response than visual stimulus which is single. We looked at in the beginning of this lecture how even a single visitor or visual stimulus will have so much information, but auditory signal as in beeping high or low beeping will tell you one information and that is pretty accurate. Sound qualities can be modified in real time to indicate urgency or priority. The more nearer to a crash you are, the more intense your crash detection system in the car starts beeping. If you have ever backed a car with a sensor, the more closer you are to the wall, the more intense the sound becomes and this is sound qualities or different kind of uh, sound can also be produced. And the choice over visual display is a complex thing. All these factors need to be taken into consideration when sounds are chosen over visual display as a warning system. Auditory display is transitory and listener has a short time to process it. One disadvantage is it is transitory and as we looked in the first class of this lecture, auditory displays are time dependent. So, the listener has very short time because it is moving in real time. The signal is moving in real time or the sound is coming one after another in real time. So, everything has to be clubbed, everything has to be perceived and meaning has to be made very quickly. Processing puts high demand on memory capacity. A lot of information in terms of words which have been spoken has to be rehearsed inside the head and not only rehearsed, but a meaning also has to be extracted out of it. So, larger amount of memory is required for processing auditory displays. Visual displays restrict mobility of operators while auditory display do not. Visual displays work only when the operator is facing it, but for auditory display the sound can come from any direction and that is why it is 
one good advantage of auditory display. So, what should be the design of an alarm system? First, it should ensure that it is de detectable. The legitimate, the legitimate values in terms of its pitch and frequencies, which is detectable, should be used in designing alarm signals. Masking by ambient noise of the same frequency reduces effectiveness. We should be sure that noises of the same frequency of which the auditory target is should not be present in the vicinity of the target sound. Alarms which are of the 15 to 25 decibels above the mark threshold are unlikely to be missed. More intense sounds can startle the operator. So, if you are giving an alarm, this should be only 15 to 25 decibel above the environmental sound which the observer or the operator is hearing. This cannot be missed, but if the intensity of the alarm is very high, the operator will become startled. High frequency sounds can startle the operator and he will press the wrong button. So, this should also be used. Also, burst of 100 to 300 milliseconds of sound are selected to optimize detectability and varying timing and loudness can also convey urgency. So, how frequently it is coming and how loud these bursts of 100 to 300 millisecond and in the 15 to 25 decibel is coming will also determine how urgent something is. The more delay it is, think about seat belts again. As time passes or when you start riding, these seat belt signs stop or they occur at lower time points. This dies down because the urgency sort of decreases. Right? So, this, this kind of burst can be used and urgency can be coded with it. Types of auditory displays. Individualized ringtones can help identify caller without lo uh, looking. Music clips and natural sounds. People often code different people with different names and different sounds. Sound of a cat, sound of a dog, sound of a bottle opening and this kind of sounds are personalized put in ringtones to signify which person is calling. Right? And so, this is one way of one type of auditory display. Now, this can be used as auditory icons and ear cons and are extensions of the visual icons. So, auditory icons are actually an extension of the visual icon where what auditory icon does is it personalizes certain kind of sound for certain kind of people. Sounds is used to represent the attributes of the object or actions that is being carried out by the user. So, the user action can also be displaced using certain kind of sounds. Natural sounds are difficult to associate with complex or uh, abstract actions. Certain kind of actions and certain kind of abstract and complex actions cannot be associated with natural sounds. For example, car backing up. Now, how, what kind of sound should I make? So, a sound was created to the tick, 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 tick sound which you hear when a car is backing up was artificially created and linked to the fact that the car is backing up and now everyone in the world knows that this is the sound for car backing up. This kind of creation of an artificial sound for demonstrating a action is called an ear con. So, ear con is a synthetic tone specifically designed to symbolize a state of action for example, car backing. Now, auditory uh, icons are naturally linked with ear cons need to be learned. Auditory icons are easy because some person is a cry baby. So, you put a sound of a baby crying on the cell phone to represent him. Some people are loud mouthed. So, uh, use a sound like that. But ear cons, certain kind of actions which have no sound associated with it as I explained in car backing, a sound is created and it is linked and this is called an ear con. Sonification involves mapping numerical relations to an acoustic domain. So, users interpret and understand the relation. Sonification is in very easy words, the more intense the sound become, the more intense you believe that a situation is getting. Geiger counters, the more beeping it does, the more the level of radiation present in a room. So, this kind of mapping that the intensity that beep increases is related to how much intense a situation is. The next thing that we want to discuss is about noise. What is noise? 
it is unwanted sound that is not related to the target sound and this can be regardless of the volume of this unwanted sound. Now, the effect of noise are complex, sometimes noise are good, sometimes they are bad. For example, in a library, a noise is created is a distractor, but in a coffee shop, a ding sound which tells you that the coffee is complete is actually a demonstration of selective attention. So, noise has its different features. Noise can create temporary hearing loss and can be produced by a loud noise sources. So, temporary hearing loss is produced by noises of 60 to 65 decibel, whereas permanent threshold shifts or hearing loss can be produced by a loud impulsive sound, a firecracker of 170 decibel or a 100 to 60, uh, 160 to 170 SPL. For temporary hearing losses, it can renewed, be renewed back over a period of time, but permanent losses cannot be. So, a gun firing right in front of your ear, a very loud cracker barking can ac actually create permanent uh, hearing impairness. Speeches can also be used as warning signals. So, operators listen to voice com communication face to face or via some other devices. So, a face to face communication or another device can speak to the operator who is performing a job and through this speech communication a warning can be set up. Now, effectiveness of electronic communication is in terms of speech intelligibility. When two people speak, when I give a command to you or the method of teaching that we are using, if I am, my speech is not properly decoded or it is not intelligible, it will create a problem. So, one feature of speech communication between people is dependent on how intelligible a speech is and that the measure of that is how well a speech is understood. How do we test for it? Presenting of test stimuli of having the listener repeat what was heard. So, people are called in and they are given different speeches. It could have a consonant vowel, it could have a vowel consonant, it could have a neutral stimulus, it could have a monosyllable word or uh, a word, it is a complex word or a sentence and people are asked to repeat them back. So, they hear this kind of sounds either face to face or via electronic device and then they have to repeat what they heard. The more better they hear and are able to reproduce what is being said, the better speech communication can happen and this speech can be used for designing better displays. Now, test stimuli are presented either using a audio or live speech. Now, to elevate effects of background noise on communication, we can use articulation index. If background noise affects speech intelligibility, this can be measured through something called articulation index. What is it? Articul articulation index or speech intelligibility index is measuring independently the intensity of speech and noise at a series of different frequency bands and subtracting the difference. So, first create a measure for the noise and then create a measure for the target stimulus the speech and subtract them. Whatever you get is called the articulation index. The difference represents how articulative the speech is. Certain environmental factors also affect speech intelligibility. Higher frequency noises disrupt hearing. So, somebody shouts of higher frequency noise creates higher frequency noise, it will disrupt the hearing. Effects of vocabulary and set size. Miller uh, did an experiment and showed that different signal to noise ratio, small sight uh, uh, results in better hearing. If you create smaller sentences, smaller set sight sentences or smaller set size words, it is better to hear than using longer words for communication. There is also a role of context in speech communication. Subject matter of communication can help the speech intelligibility. Suppose people know what subject matter is being taught. This is a psychology class. So, even if you do not understand or not able to hear certain sounds which I am producing, just by knowing that it is a psychology class, you can fill in what probably is being said and so this is called the role of context. What 
कॉन्टेक्स्ट और अगेंस्ट वॉट बैकग्राउंड अ पर्टिकुलर स्पीच इज बींग रिलेट और अ पर्टिकुलर स्पीच इज बींग मेड दैट विल टेल यू वॉट इज द प्रॉबेबल वर्ड दैट यू आर मिसिंग और द प्रॉबेबल सेंटेंस दैट यू डोंट अंडरस्टैंड सो रीडिंग टू लाइन्स बिफोर एंड टू लाइन्स बैक एंड रीडिंग वॉट इज द कॉन्टेक्स्ट or in under what what background this speech is being made will help you in deciphering and making you understand what probably is the word which is creating the problem so in this lecture we looked at certain features of sound we looked at what are auditory displays and we also looked at how to make auditory displays and speech communication better this is all for today's lecture I'll sign off from the MOOC studio now and thank you and namaskar. Mm -hmm.